Hey everybody, what's going on? You got Eric Worrell here with rentprep.com and the co-host of Ask a Property Manager, who is the source of knowledge because he's a property manager, associate broker, <laughs> Andrew Schultz. How you doing, Andrew? Good. How are you this morning? I'm doing pretty good. I'm, uh, good. I'm enjoying my morning. Uh, and I'm uh, enjoying this episode already because we got a lot of uh, posts in the group over the last week about one specific uh, topic that kind of went viral outside of the landlord space. So you said you weren't quite familiar with it. Have you heard about this uh, 30 year old who's gotten evicted uh, from his parents' house? I, I'm vaguely familiar with it. I haven't really paid much attention to it in the news because we've been pretty busy this past week, but mm -hmm. uh, kind of bring me up to speed a little bit. Uh, well, I've actually got a video that I included on this post and this is kind of, you know, not the, the coolest way of sharing it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on screen here and then hopefully the audio can kind of get picked up a little bit and you'll be able to hear what's going on here. I got a minute clip. If I try to do it through this uh, Be Live software, it's going to like break everything. So I'm going to see how this goes. <laughs> All right. Hopefully you can hear it fine. A New York judge has told 30-year-old Michael Rotundo he must move out of his parents' house in Camillus near Syracuse. Rotundo wittingly voluntarily, so his mom and dad took him to court, saying he had ignored five written notices to leave. But the son says he's been unable to leave because he's been in a custody battle. They said you need to get a job, you get health insurance. I said I'm, you know, I'm giving my son back. That's what I'm doing. As for his job, Rotundo told reporters that he runs a business but wouldn't elaborate. The judge in Syracuse urged Rotundo to leave on his own accord, but the son said he needed more time. A six-month uh, notice to put is a reasonable amount of time for someone who has been depending on. Uh, uh, persons to uh for support according to court documents rotundo says he never was expected to contribute to the family home during the last eight years he's lived there at one point his parents offered him eleven hundred dollars to leave well, i was really <laughs> hoping that i'd be able to give it back but i had to spend it and i don't i'm not sorry about it rotundo calls the ruling outrageous and says he plans to appeal <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff to unpack there this dude's uh, parents cash for keys to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's and awesome. it didn't work. It didn't even work. Right. He wanted uh, he wanted six months to uh, he wanted the six month notification. You ever get a uh, six month notice request from a tenant? <laughs> um, I've never I've never had that happen exactly like that. No. <laughs> yeah, I just thought it would be a uh, funny little uh, story to kind of start off the. Uh, the broadcast here with because it definitely that's caught crazy. the attention yeah well that's that's not far from us either syracuse is what three hours east of us yeah yeah i and you know so, what's sad is i uh, do a in the news segment on our podcast and it seems like a lot of the crazy things that happen come from upstate new york so go figure yeah i could see that <laughs> <laughs> all right well let's start getting to some of the questions that came up in the rent prep for landlords facebook group recently uh, we have a question that came from Yvette. I kind of shortened it a little bit, but what she says is that she wants to let an annual lease morph into a month-to-month -month rental. Should I send the tenant a notice? The current lease is fixed term with no mentions of it turning into a month-to-month -month lease after the year. Uh, Why did you pick this question, Andrew, and what are your thoughts on it? All right. So there is some state-specific stuff to this one. Um, some states will require you to. Some states will require you to draft a new agreement. Some states will just say that that, uh, that one-year agreement automatically defuncts over to a month-to-month -month agreement. Um, kind of depends on your state what the specifics are there in terms of how that would work out. If I'm letting someone go from a yearly to a month-to-month, -month, generally that's going to come with an increase in rent, which doesn't sound like that's the case here because the property owner wants it to go month-to-month -month and not the, uh, not the tenant specifically. But um, I would still do a new notice, or I'm sorry, a new, uh, a new lease agreement, specifying that it's a month-to-month -month agreement. The reason I would do that is simply because that way everything is spelled out. There's no, there's no question as to it being a month-to-month -month agreement or what the terms thereof are or anything like that. It's not just a rollover from a one year into a month-to-month. -month. So I, I just like to have everything as current as possible. That's why yeah. I would recommend going with a, a new month-to-month -month agreement. Yeah, and I know this question comes up a lot where um, maybe somebody buys a uh, rental property and there's existing tenants and there's no lease in place. Uh, I don't know if it's like this for every state, but typically, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, those are just treated as a month-to-month -month, uh, rentals uh, in those situations. In New York, yeah, that's how it would be treated. Um, yeah. 
a lot of times you won't you'll either not get a lease or they'll be on a month to month term. If they're on a month to month, we'll usually try to get them to sign our lease when we take over the management on it. Okay. Even if we leave them on month to month terms, just so that they know what the, what the rules are, what's expected of them, how to pay rent, this, that, the other thing. Um, that's typically what we would do in an instance like that. If they are on a lease in the state of New York, their lease survives the sale of the property. So what that means is you basically inherit that tenant and inherit that lease. And if it's a poorly worded lease, it could really cause you a lot of headaches uh, in that lease term. So that's something you're definitely going to want to pay attention to during your due diligence period is making sure that the lease is something that you're willing to accept if it's if it's something where they have a, a longer term lease. Yeah, I had a uh, friend who bought a rental property and he was like house hacking and he was living on one side and then the other side uh, he was running out. But he bought it from the parents of the tenant. So their son had lived in there and they made it the stipulation of that lease that uh, he had like um, at least like something like three years or something like that into baked into the lease. And I know that he ended up That's having crazy. troubles. Yeah. He ended up having troubles with that runner because he pretty much like felt untouchable. Like, what are you going to do? Like I have this ironclad lease or something like that. So um, it's something just kind of to consider if you're buying a rental property to just really look over the uh, current renters and what their lease scenario is uh, written up to be. So, yeah, that's crazy. I would definitely not be willing to sign a lease like that. That's totally insane to me. Yeah. I mean, not to judge people, but you've, you've heard of juggalos. Oh yeah. Guess, yeah. He was a juggalo, I guess this guy. And, uh, it was, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of nice juggalos out there, you know, but there's some that maybe are a little more rough around the edges. Maybe. You are, know? are they still classified as a, as a domestic terrorist organization? Yeah. Yeah. They are. I believe. Yeah. Last yeah. I heard. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that'd show up on a background check, you know, <laughs> the terrorist watch list. But so we got another question here. It comes from Kendra and she asked, how do you handle payment documentation to a handyman on your unit? So not an employee, just a person paid to do work here and there. He asked if they plan to give uh, give him a 1099. Okay. So I like this question. Um, first thing you're going to want to do is if you're hiring someone else to do work on your property, you need to make sure that they have proper insurance, liability, comp, whatever the case may be, liability at a minimum. Um, and then if they have more than one person working for them, they need to have a workman's comp policy as well. Um, make sure you get yourself named as an additional insured or an additional interest on the liability policy so that if something does happen to the contractor, um, you've got that coverage there. And then the other thing I would make sure to mention is get a W-9 from them up front. Uh, and then the W-9, that's your standard IRS form. It allows the contractor to report their either their social security number or their tax ID number if it's a business. Uh, and that's what you're going to use to generate your tax forms at the end of the year, your 1099 MISC form that you'll generate to send out to them, assuming they made more than $600 in the course of the year. Definitely handle that stuff up front. Because on the off chance that something goes sour with the contractor and, you know, down the road, they're not going to want to give you this information. Mm -hmm. So get it up front so that you protect yourself on the front end before you even engage in the work. Yeah. In regards uh, to the work. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say real quick. I thought you were wrapping up there on that. I was just going to say hello to Mia who says hi. But, um, yeah, regards to the work, Andrew, sorry. Yeah, no problem. So with regards to the work, make sure that you have a written contract in place that both of you have signed off on the contract specifying, you know, what work is supposed to be done, what the cost of the work is supposed to be. If it's a bigger project, make sure that it outlines what the draw schedule is supposed to be and what milestones need to be hit in order to uh, unlock that next draw for the contractor yeah. and stick to that contract. So if the contractor comes in, say they're doing a, a kitchen and bathroom remodel and they're supposed to get 50% down for materials and then 25% at the midpoint, 25% at the completion. So we'll say midpoint is when the kitchen is complete and endpoint is when the bathroom is complete. So make sure that that kitchen is 100% complete before you release that second draw. Otherwise you could be setting yourself up for some headaches there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, when you go to pay, make sure it's traceable. Ca uh, cash is always a no-no. Make sure it's a check, um, certified funds check from a bank. A regular check is fine because you can still prove that it was uh, it was cashed. Money orders are fine. I avoid paying anybody cash ever um, mm -hmm. just because it's much more difficult to trace. Even if you have a receipt from them saying, oh, I received this payment, 
you know, it's, it's always better to have provable documentation on, on your side when you get into these types of situations. Yep. All right. I think that answers that question. And uh, let's move on to the third and final question for today. Uh, this comes from Jessica and she asks, how strict are you on income when all other things are good? I have a great applicant who is semi-retired making two and 2.4 times the rent. And I'm kind of going to do the rest of this from memory because I don't want to take up too much of the screen. But I think in this particular case, the person was working at a grocery store 30 hours a week. They also had a small pension. Um, they had great credit. Everything so far checked out great, except for the rent to income ratio, which I'm guessing she probably had a three X standard based on this question. So yeah. um, what are your thoughts on this, Andrew? Well, I mean, we go by that 3X standard as well, and I'm, I'm pretty inflexible on it, to be honest with you. I want to see that three times the rent and income um, simply because it makes me feel a little bit more secure. It makes that the tenant should have plenty of plenty of income there to pay the rent, take care of their other bills, and, and not have to worry about too much of anything. What you can do if they don't meet the three times the rent guideline, and if you really want this tenant, you've got a couple of things that you can look at. Talk to previous landlord references. Uh, make sure that you verify that it's a true landlord reference and not just a friend who's playing the part. Um, easy way to do that is compare the tax record for the property against the name that they gave you as the landlord. And if there's a mismatch there, that's almost immediately a red flag. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing you can do is try to find information on the property. You know, if this person's moving, chances are there's going to be somebody else coming in. You might be able to find a rental ad, see if there's a name and a number on the rental ad or something like that. That's another tactic we've found that's worked in the past. Just trying to find, make sure that the landlord reference you're getting is valid, not not something fake. So um, running that one uh, by me again here, just to break it down. So if you have somebody move out of a rental property and they provide in their application, here is the previous address and phone number of the landlord. Many times you might be able to find that there's an ad online for that property. And if they yeah. list any kind of information like name and phone number and it's not matching up, there's a good chance that maybe there's something fishy going something on. Something might be fishy there. Yeah. The I other like thing that. would be the, the tax record. We always check the, the tax record of the property versus the uh, versus the name that's given as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the questions that we ask when we do our landlord verifications is, do you own the property or do you manage the property? Um, and if they tell us they own the property, but the name doesn't match, well, that's a pretty big red flag right there. So, sure. Yeah. Um, one of the, there's, there's a few things to watch for there. One of the things we do at Rent Prep, because we make these verification calls on the uh, platinum calls uh, or platinum reports we do, is asking open-ended questions. So not just saying like, oh, the rent was $1,100, correct? And then that person is exactly. just going to say, yes, you know, like, oh, how much was the rent? Because that's the thing that most landlords are going to remember, even if you got a few properties or you're going to, you know, remember the address instead of saying like, oh, can you verify the address of that uh, rental on uh, right, right. Lovering Ave, you know, and you can get, let them give you the number, those kind of things. Yep. Uh, and those are, uh, you know, you don't have to go crazy with those. But if you start feeling like this might be a little fishy, that might be a good time to inject a uh, open ended question like that. Yeah, exactly. So um, we kind of got diverted there. But yeah, I mean, a good landlord reference is definitely helpful, assuming that the uh, the rents are similar. So if you're renting a place for, say, 900, the place they're coming out of is 500. There's a pretty big disparity there. Just because they had a good landlord reference at 500 doesn't mean they're going to be able to carry that 900 as well. So that's something to take into account yeah. uh, when you're when you're kind of thinking through this. The other thing I would look at would be their um, credit report. On the credit report, you're going to be able to see, and I don't. I, I apologize, I don't know all the packages that you guys are offering right now, but I know the package that we're using on the uh, on the corporate side, on the management side, we're able to see a full credit report and see all of their accounts, what their balances are, if or when they've been past due, things like that. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good indicator as well. I mean, a good credit score is going to indicate that they have a good payment history and things like that. But if you're sitting there and looking at length of accounts and you see that they've had a you know, a car loan for three years now and they've never missed a payment on it. You know, they've got a couple of established credit cards or something like that with low or no balances that they've been, you know, consistently paying with no late pays. Being able to kind of complete that picture by looking at the credit history is, mm -hmm. is very useful in this instance. Yeah, yeah. And it just kind of depends on what package you use. We also offer Smart Move, which just lists them out as trade lines. And it'll get like these uh, series of green checks. So it's kind of nice because let's say it's been around for 40 months. You'll see 40 check marks, whether they're green check marks or red X's. 
So you can right. kind of just do a quick synopsis of like, oh, there's like three red X's on here. What's going on? They were late three different times in 40 months on this uh, credit card bill. Um, right. And then I believe you're uh, running on the platinum reports, which uh, are structured a little bit differently, but you still get that information on late accounts and late pays and all that. And, you know, that all factors in, of course, into their credit score as well. Exactly. Okay, cool. Well, I believe that wraps up episode 42 of Ask a Property Manager. Um, I wanted to, uh, on the way out here, I'm sure you probably recognize this name, Bonnie Church. I think Bonnie Waltenberg Church. Uh, she's an active member of the Facebook group. Uh, she actually posted yesterday saying that she's leaving the group and it's because she's selling her rental property. She wants to abide by group rules, which she could stay if she wanted. Um, but one of the things she said is she's learned a lot from uh, watching these videos, uh, from uh, listening to the podcast and getting so much help from people in the Facebook group, which I thought was awesome. She uh, tagged me in the comment, too, which I really appreciated. And um, I just wanted to say thanks to Bonnie for that nice comment and uh, giving us, you know, a little extra juice to do these videos because we know people are watching and they're getting uh, help out of it to manage the rental properties. Yeah, absolutely. We love getting the feedback on these videos. It's super, super important to us to know that people are actually watching them and you know, if you guys have suggestions or anything like that on how we can make these shows better, we're certainly open to that. And uh, going back to Bonnie briefly, Bonnie, stick around in the group. There's always there's always knowledge that you can dispense to maybe landlords that are in a situation that you've encountered before or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. I would say that uh, I've, I remember seeing several posts from her, so I know she's a good contributor. Um, stick around. We could always use we could always use good advice. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Yvette, she says hello. Hi, Yvette. Uh, if you want to go back on this video, Yvette, we uh, answered your question about us uh, morphing from that annual lease into the month to month rental. So uh, hopefully that helps answer that along with the uh, answers you got on your post in the Rent Prep for Landlords Facebook group. And if you are watching this on our Facebook page and you haven't joined the group yet, there is a link in the uh, copy in the description of this video where you can join uh, and get in on the action of all the helpful landlords and property managers in the group. So you got anything else to add, Andrew? Um, I'm going to plug my page if that's cool with you. Yeah, do it up. Cool. All right. So you can find our page. We're, we're in the Buffalo, New York area. We kind of operate between, uh, basically all of Western New York, Erie, Niagara counties is where we're, most of our property management is. Then we do, uh, you know, investment properties and foreclosed properties and stuff like that. Basically from Lake Erie all the way to Rochester. Um, so we kind of cover a pretty broad geographic region over here. It's kind of interesting to see some of the stuff that we post. You can find our page at uh, facebook.com slash buffalo foreclosed homes. That's foreclosed with a D at the end. Uh, so buffalo foreclosed homes. We post quite a bit of info over there. I do a lot of uh, different walkthrough videos and things like that. And I think later today we're going to be posting a video of a post eviction walkthrough that we just did. Mm-hmm. It was a tenant that we inherited from another management company when we took over the contract. And uh, it just, the tenant unfortunately was a non-payer and ended up having to go and they just left a total mess behind on this property. So you get to see kind of a behind the scenes first look. Um, you'll get to hear me with my, with my respirator on. It was, it was, it was pretty bad. I had to put my respirator on before I could walk in. So yeah. that'll be a fun video to watch. And if somebody wants to search for that, would they just search Buffalo foreclosed homes on Facebook? If they, uh, I think if you search, I think if you search Buffalo foreclosed homes, we should pop up the, okay. the full name of the page is Buffalo now I got to remember Buffalo foreclosed homes and investment properties or Buffalo foreclosures and investment properties, something like that. Yep. The, uh, the page icon is actually a, a image of the state of New York with a, with a star over Buffalo. So it's okay. pretty easy to find. One last question. You, uh, do you work with out of town investors? So let's say if somebody wants to buy rental properties here, you can take them through the whole process, right? Yep. Yeah. We're basically a soup to nuts property management company. We can help you find investment property We can help you analyze investment property. We can manage investment property on your behalf. Um, We're we're set up to do pretty much everything. So uh, soup to nuts, that's what we do. I would say about 75% of my client base right now is Mm out-of-towners. And out of that 75%, I would say at least half of that is out of the country. So uh, I would say that, uh, you know, we've got pretty, pretty broad reach that way. Very cool. All right. So, yeah, if anybody's interested in that, they can always pick Andrew's brain if they have any questions. And uh, yeah, Andrew, thanks again for being on the show here. I look forward to uh, talking with you next week. And uh, thank you, everyone, for the questions that you've submitted and for being an active uh, member of the Facebook group. It's awesome to see all the action and engagement in there. And we appreciate it. 
Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. It means a lot to us to, to get feedback on these and to, to know that people are actually watching on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, thanks and take care, everyone. And we will talk to you next week.